If you're wondering, yes, I'm dry. <laughs> but I'm out of breath. <laughs> I had to run quick to get back here in time. Um, I'm so thrilled for those who are taking the steps of their faith journey and following the Lord in water baptism is such a remarkable thing. There are a number of you who signed up for our membership class scheduled for March 16th. And as it turns out, uh, we're going to have to reschedule that day. I have a, a complication being able to be there that day, uh, schedule-wise, so we're going to reschedule that. So all of you who signed up, you're gonna get an email about the new date, and my apologies for that, that's, that's on me. I wanna start a new series this morning, and it's on emotionally healthy spirituality. I think for some people, Prayer is boring, and faith feels like pretending. For some people, faith is boring, or it feels like pretending, and prayer is boring. And some people are afraid to acknowledge some of the things that they're going through in their life, because they fear that somehow it indicates they're getting the whole spiritual journey thing wrong. And so the result is, is that a lot of us will go into a kind of denial about what's happening in our lives, but we'll, we'll cover it over with religious language so that it sounds like we're, we're trying to exercise faith. Uh, Jesus was insistent that the operating system for a healthy life is truth. The operating system for a healthy life is truth. And he said, that when we know truth, when we live truth, when we walk in truth, that's where we find freedom. He will make us free. So, question, when was the last time you prayed your emotions? For a lot of us, we, we pray for our loved ones, we, we pray for decisions, we, we pray for challenges that we're facing, but when was the last time you included a prayer that identified your emotions? For example, this is kind of an easy one. In Psalm 100, the psalmist it has a prayer about joy, about joy. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are the people, the sheep of his pasture. Maybe you've prayed a prayer like that. How about a prayer like this? My God whom I praise. Do not remain silent, for people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues, with words of hatred they've surrounded me. They attack me without cause. When was the last time you prayed an angry prayer? Or how about this, Psalm 22. This will sound familiar because Jesus actually quotes from this song, this psalm on, on his crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out day by day, but you do not answer by night, but I have no rest. When was the last time you prayed your grief? Praying honest emotions actually helps us discover what's going on underneath our emotions. What's causing, what's driving, what's facilitating what we're feeling. For an example, anger is actually a secondary emotion. There's other things that cause anger. For example, we might be afraid and so we respond in anger. Sometimes we feel sad and we're uncomfortable acknowledging our sadness, but we're more comfortable acknowledging our frustration. Or maybe we're hurt. And so we have a difficult time admitting or acknowledging that we've been hurt, and so we hide it with our anger. Or maybe shame. Anger can become the defense mechanism that we use to hide the other things that are going on in our life. If you are afraid of being unloved or abandoned or feel like that's happening in your life, it's amazing how often anger is the way that we express some emotion. 
And uh, if you're afraid of, of being insecure, you don't want people to know that about you. Sadness, disappointment. And if, if you feel dishonored and disrespected, we often respond with a secondary emotion, but we have a hard time identifying what's the primary emotion. Please hear this. We cannot know how we are feeling if we do not know what we are feeling. We cannot know how we are feeling if we do not know what we are feeling. And we get asked this all the time, right? How are you doing? How's it going? What's our automatic reply? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, doing good. I have gone to the doctor, sick. And the doctor walks in the office room and, and, and says, how are you doing? And I, I'm doing good. It's just a habit. And obviously, if I were doing good, that's not where I would be. But many of us do not tell anyone anything. We think that God requires us to just grin and bear it. Pretend as though nothing hurts and keep moving forward. And this is our definition of faith. When my daughter went to college in one of her first classes, a professor asked them to write down all the emotions that they had experienced in their life. Some people couldn't get past two or three. Um, let me ask you, if God asked you today, how are you doing? How would you answer him? Well, we, we tend to pretend. And there's reasons for that. Sometimes we just don't want to be a burden to other people. We don't want to add our weight to their lives. We already are aware of some of the things that they are carrying. And sometimes we just don't want to risk being vulnerable. We don't want other people to see us as needing something or someone in our life. And, and sometimes we just want to manage other people's opinions of us that they will always see us as strong and capable and, and healthy. And so we try not to use any statements that would change their view. And there's a word in the Bible for exercising these options. Just to warn you up front, it's, it's not a complimentary word. The word is hypocrite. Now, we think of hypocrite as just someone who's a bold-faced liar, two-faced. But the word hypocrite in Scripture actually comes from the root word to put a mask on, to to act, to play a part. And we can do this thinking this is what we're supposed to do in our faith. We put on the everything's okay mask, and then we act that part while we're around other people. And, uh, and we think that that's what God expects of us. We think that's what God wants us to do. And some of us have reduced our faith to doing and knowing, but we've left out being. What does God want us to become? So spiritual, spirituality is not virtual reality. It's not an imaginary plane that we go to to escape the more demanding and less enjoyable aspects of our real life. We have to deal with reality. Spirituality deals with reality. If we segregate our life into spiritual and not spiritual, we'll wind up living a double life. And scripture tells us that when we go about life that way, we become unstable. And so that's not what scripture calls us to do. So Jesus shows us what it's like to live an emotionally authentic life. Jesus had emotions. One of the things I really don't like about some of the older movies of Jesus, if you've ever seen them, is he walks around in kind of like a catatonic state. No expression on his face. People come to him all upset, almost bored he looks. You know, just, okay, you're healed. Okay, we'll raise that person from the dead. Just, there's no real emotions in this guy. And I don't think that's what the biblical Jesus looks like at all. 
Maybe you were raised in a family where you were not allowed some emotions. Maybe you weren't allowed to be unhappy or sad. Someone expected you to always put a smile on your face. Some of us were raised in families where we were not allowed to express our anger in any way. That would be punished. There would be discipline that would come to us. Some of us were not allowed to try things because if we failed, it might look bad on us or the rest of the family. And so we live this life of pretending. Uh, the emotions, if they were not acceptable in our family, we've learned to hide them, deny them, bury them. And, that, and that's not just a family thing. Sometimes that can be a church thing, right? Uh, there are some people, they have a hard time expressing joy in God's house because that's just not how it's supposed to be. A Presbyterian friend of mine told me, he said, do you know why we don't raise hands in our church? I said, no. He said, we're afraid God will call on us. And it's just, <laughs> don't do that. Hmm. To, ex to express joy, to express sadness, to express grief, to express sorrow, and it can make us uncomfortable. And one of the things that was true about Jesus is when people came to him, they could tell. They didn't have to pretend anything. If they were happy, they could celebrate, and he would celebrate with them. If they were filled with, with uh, doubt, with grief, with sadness, with pain, they could be honest about that. And Jesus ministered to them. Too often, we use God as a way to escape from reality. We come to a place like this thinking, well, at least I can be out of the things that I don't like in my life for an hour. And that's not how God sees. We've, we can reduce our faith into the, the words that we say, into the things that we've learned, and to the behaviors that we act on. And all of that can be surface level. God says, People look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. He wants to get down to the core of our being. So in the core of our being, there can be things that are in conflict. Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever had something to be happy about and something to be frustrated about at the same time? And, and this is what people will tell us. Well, you need to decide what's true. Both of those things can be true. And God's not asking us to pretend about any of it. So, and then, does this happen to you? When we're not dealing with our real emotions, sometimes they sneak out in places we don't expect them to. And we have this kind of delayed response. And so someone will get the brunt of our emotions that has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in, in that conversation or in that experience. So, well, what happened? Well, because we wouldn't deal with something, it comes out when we're unprepared for it. And when it comes out, it, so I'm not trying to be cute here. It doesn't confuse the hell out of us. It confuses hell into us. This, this lack of authenticity causes things to happen in places and spaces that, that some of those individuals don't deserve what's happening. So how are we supposed to deal with this? And it was a, oh, pastor, when did you take a psychology class? That's what you're doing now, isn't it? No, 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 this is not psychology. This is spirituality. Some of us have actually come to believe that if you become more spiritual, you become less human. That if you become more spiritual, you just get rid of all of your emotions. You, you can just go through life without feeling pain. Here's the challenge. God is the one who gave you the capacity for emotions. He intended for you. It's not really possible for us to navigate life killing all of our emotions. With Jesus, we see him as fully God and fully human. And that doctrine is one of the bedrock doctrines of Christianity. If he were only divine, then he can't know what we're going through. If he's only human, then he can't pay the price for our sins and for our failures. So he has to be completely both. So Jesus was both divine and human. So 
Jesus experienced emotions. Let's take a look. I know some of you are worried that I, I don't have a scripture to talk about today. Let's take a look at some of the emotions of Jesus. Jesus experienced grief. Grief. Uh, in John 11, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. For those of you who want to start memorizing scripture, it's the shortest verse in the Bible, and it's hard to forget. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Do you apologize for your tears? I do. I was raised and I was taught that that's not what I'm supposed to do. Did Jesus tell Mary to stop crying? Did Jesus hide his own tears? No, Jesus was authentic with his emotions in that moment. He wasn't pretending, he was feeling. He was feeling. He was honest, he was authentic, he was transparent. How about this, did Jesus ever experience internal conflict? Yes. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Then Jesus went out with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Did you hear the words that Jesus spoke? My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. I don't want to be alone right now. Can you be with me? Can you pray with me? Those are the words of Jesus. My father, he prayed, is it possible for this cup to be taken from me? This is not what he wanted, but he was also able to say, even though I know this will be painful and hard and heavy, and it will take everything that I've got and it will cost me my life, I am willing to trust you. We have rebranded and redefined trust to mean that if I trust God, everything will go the way I want it to go. That is not what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that when you walk through the fire and you walk through the flood and you walk through a valley that casts a shadow of death, that you don't have to fear evil, not because it's gone, but because he is with you. Is there anybody in the house glad that no matter what, he's with you? Yes, always, always. Here's one. Jesus experienced anger. Some of you just decided to pay attention to this message. You just woke up. You think you're going to find a justification for the way you behave. Matthew 21, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out. The words drove out do not mean an invitation to step outside for a minute. He drove out all who were buying and selling there and he overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to the temple and he healed them. People were being taken advantage of. Part of the sacrificial system in the old covenant was that you would bring sin offerings and that you would offer them up to God and you 
that would be the moment of atonement for you and you would walk away feeling as though that your sins had been atoned for. As they came in, there were professional people in the temple who would look at their, their sacrifice, their bird, their, their goat, their sheep, whatever it was that they brought in and they would tell them, oh, that, that's a defective sacrifice right there. We can't accept that. So what am I supposed to do? Well, we just happen to have some acceptable sacrifices right over here and for this much money, you too can have one. And so for some people, they had to pay that money. How can you worship when you feel like you've been taken advantage of on the way to the altar? Or some people just didn't have the money, and so they had to turn around and walk out the door. The doors to worship were being closed by the people who were supposed to prop them open. And what was Jesus' response to that? Anger. God was being misrepresented. The temple was being dishonored. Jesus did not hide his anger. He didn't deny it. But here's an important thing. He also didn't sin in his anger. How do I know that? Because the blind and the lame, those who had not been allowed entrance into the temple, came to him and he healed them. These healings were not an effort for Jesus to make up for his bad behavior. The ministry that was supposed to be happening was now happening because of what he had done. So the Bible does not tell us not to be angry. It tells us not to sin when we are angry. By the way, Jesus experienced joy too. Luke 10, at that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those whom God or the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. I mean, Jesus embraced joy. He wasn't embarrassed about it. Uh, let's just check. How many parents do we have in the, in the room? That's quite a lot of you. <laughs> And we all know where your kids are right now. And, uh, and we're so grateful for those ministries. And, and so if you've ever gotten a gift for your child and watch them with reckless abandon, jump up and down and squeal with delight because they couldn't believe that they got that. Did you ever look at your child doing that and go, oh, geez, I'm so embarrassed by the way they're acting right now. Jeez, please. No, you know what we do? We, we video that and post it on Facebook and Instagram. Do you think God is embarrassed by your expression of joy? Well, pastor, it's not very mature. Yes, you are right. And that's why Jesus said, if we want to come to God, we must come as children. Our maturity doesn't gain us better access to God. Uh, when we ignore the emotional parts of our life, we reduce the other parts of our life. Jesus didn't ignore his emotions. Spirituality is not a way to deny part of life. Spirituality is a way to process all of life. That's how it's supposed to be. So God gave us emotions, and it's not possible for us to experience a full life without them. So what we can do is pay attention to what our feelings reveal because there's something going on underneath the emotions. And if we don't know what that is, then we'll walk in a kind of blindness to what God is doing. What happened? What am I feeling? Uh, my, my little granddaughter is five years old. We had pitched a tent in their yard. And uh, so I was setting it, uh, packing it all up to go. And she came out, she was going to help me. And how many know five-year-olds are amazingly helpful. They're just, and so she jumped up on the cot 
and, and was standing on it, and it made me anxious because I thought there was a really good chance that that could tip over. It's, it's not the most balanced thing, and, and then she could get hurt, so I scooped her up really fast, and I set her down, and I said, you can sit on the cot, you can lay on the cot. Please don't stand on the cot, because you could get hurt. And she said, pop, pop. I said, yes. She said, you know when you scooped me up? I said, yes. She said, when you did that, you did it really fast, and it made me afraid. So then she said, so the next time you scoop me up, could you do it just a little slower? <laughs> and I looked at her, whose kid are you? <laughs> do you know what she did? She told me what I did, she told me how it made her feel, and she told me what I could do better next time. And she's already doing better than 80% of the adults in my world, right? That's just true, right? Don't ignore your feelings. Pray your feelings. In prayer, we can bring anything to God. We don't have to pretend anything. There's no pretense in God's kingdom. Last, last week, we learned about the power of confession. We can even bring our faults and failures into the presence of God our guilt and our shame, and we can verbalize those things and know that God welcomes us into his presence when we are honest with him. And the point is, this is what the church can be, a place where people don't have to pretend. Do you know how many of our lives and how many of our relationships are based on pretending? Well, we got to be this way for this person, this way for this person. Uh, it's a quote. I can't, I can't give you the name of the author because no one would respect the quote, but it's still a good quote. And it is, in this bankrupt culture of ours, the only currency we have worth sharing is what we share with each other when we're not trying to impress each other. Just being honest. Are we too busy to be emotionally and spiritually healthy? Because that can happen. We can have so many things going on in our lives or our little to very large screens that distract us. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. The screen can distract you, but it cannot heal you. It may keep you from feeling something for a few minutes, but that's not the same thing as being made whole. It takes time to process what's going on inside of us, and it's not a comfortable thing to do. But we have to decide. And for some of us, this is just the pattern we learned growing up in the place we grew up and the people we hang around. But I have a question for you. Are you going to keep perpetuating that pattern? Maybe the people around you didn't know any better. It's also true that they didn't try anything else. Maybe that could be different for you. Because of your faith, it frees you up to acknowledge what is true and have conversations that you'd rather avoid. And to watch as God moves into that situation with you and what he can redeem in all of it. So what will you do? How real? Do you want your spirituality to be real enough to get real with God? Real enough to be honest about what's going on around you? That's where faith becomes more than just a thought. It becomes a real thing in our lives. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, we want to be done pretending. We do. We're tired of the energy it takes to be something and someone we are not. And you have created this amazing community of faith 
So many of our other relationships are based on what we present ourselves to be. Would you help us see that there is this amazing relationship in the earth called the church where we don't have to pretend anything. When we're hurting, we can acknowledge it and receive prayer. When we're struggling, when we're addicted, when we're alone, when we're depressed, when we're suicidal, when whatever it is that we're going through in our life, when we're joyful, when we're happy, when we're celebrating, we don't have to hide our life to be around people who have joined us in faith. We can rejoice with those who rejoice and we can weep and mourn with those who weep and mourn. Will you help us live out an authentic life in you?